The, um, no, this, this part of the ACCS exam review focuses in on the fundamentals of ECGs or EKGs. I'll refer to them in, in you know, both terminology throughout the presentation. And then the second half or so is related to end tidal CO2 waveforms. So let's take a let's take a closer look here. So some of the learning objectives for the first half of the presentation will be reviewing the basic anatomy of the heart. This isn't an anatomy lesson, but in order to better understand the anomalies that can occur, the dysrhythmias, the abnormal heart rhythms, also known as dysrhythmias that occur, a lot of that is based in the basic anatomy of the heart. So a, a quick review of that can help give some insight along those lines. Likewise, we'll be describing the cardiac conducting or conduction system, which really does also relate to the basic anatomy. But again, when that conducting system gets disrupted, like the, um, you know, crudely, like the uh, electrical conducting system in your apartment or your house, um, things can go awry. We'll be discussing indications for ECGs or EKGs, summarizing the basics of how to analyze them, including, believe it or not, you know, looking at a normal ECG. And then we'll look at, look at deviations from that. Um, we're reviewing common rhythms and dysrhythmias and briefly discussing the causes and the treatment. And we talk about causes and treatment. We'll be focusing in on the short list. Uh, debatably, there's courses, there's books written on ECGs and EKGs. Um, I'll be sharing some of those resources at the end of this presentation. So obviously, we need to kind of pick and choose. So we're, we're actually sharing with you the short list of causes and the short list of treatments. And as I just said, we'll be furnishing you guys with additional resources, including some classic textbook and review guides that focus strictly in on ECGs. So the conducting pathway, the reason why we're actually uh, bothering to, to talk about this is the, the normal, so for most or all of us, the normal pacemaker in the heart is the SA node, the sinus atrial node. And that accounts for, in an adult, it accounts for a normal heart rate between 60 and 100, 60 and 100. There are times, however, when the um, conducting pathway emanating from the SA node gets interrupted. And the AV node or AV junction takes over. So it will take over at a rate of about 40 to 60, which is pretty much enough to uh, sustain individuals, okay, as far as their, you know, their health and, and their life. Um, but clearly it's not necessarily enough um, if they were to become, uh, you know, if, if a workload, a significant workload, whether that be because of exertion or be because of recovery from trauma, recovery from sepsis, things along those lines. And then further down the pathways, if that particular, um, you know, that, that um, pacemaker gets interrupted, the bundle branches and the Purkinje network take over at a minimally acceptable 30 to 40. So as we go through some of these common dysrhythmias, particularly ones that relate to bradycardia, in some cases, those dysrhythmias emanate from a disruption in the, from the dominant pacemaker, causing an escape pacemaker to take over. A little bit of ECG, EKG, graphical depiction. I don't mean to insult anybody if you guys know this by heart, whatever, but you know, this part of the presentation is on ECGs. And I would be remiss if I wasn't to briefly, however briefly, describe, you know, what what um, each of these um, occurrences in the ECG or EKG tracing stand for. So the P wave, P as in Peter, correlates to atrial depolarization. So the top of the heart where it's actually excitable, it's actually contracting, depolarization. The QRS correlates with ventricular depolarization. So the big squeeze from the ventricles in order to eject blood out of the heart. The T waves relate to ventricular repolarization, so they recharge. And then the U waves relate to what they, what they call an after potential. In some cases, you can't even see U, U waves. 
Now let's take a look at some of the um, some of the indications. So, for instance, an individual presents to the emergency room, and again, there could well be questions like this uh, in both the ACCS as well as the TMC and the the entry level um, a clinical simulation exam. Individual presents to the emergency room with chest pain. One of the key aspects for the triage nurse or the physician initially assessing them is to determine, is this chest pain cardiac in nature or is it something, you know, orthopedic, the patient uh, fell or the, you know, the patient had some sort of, um, you know, issue. They've had some, you know, recent surgery or something along those lines that account for the chest pain. So really to delineate, is that chest pain, you know, orthopedic or um, is it cardiac in nature? If the individual presenting to the ED is, you know, has a history of, you know, heart history, or for instance, their family member, father, mother have had a history and maybe their, um, their cardiac, uh, um, you know, symptoms of the parent occurred at an earlier age, they're going to probably do an ECG. Um, if the individual is um, in their, in their fifties or older, likewise, if the um, you know, the, the, the pain radiates in a, a manner that we've come to understand is, is associated with cardiac anomalies, such as shoulder pain, pain that radiates to the, to the jaw, that sort of thing. Um, it, it perhaps increases with exertion. Those would be the sorts of uh, chest pain symptoms that would certainly warrant an ECG, which is an easy test to do can, you know, be done even in, you know, smaller community hospitals can be done very, very quickly. Um, you know, so chest pain, dyspnea on exertion, again, trying to discern, you know, is this patient, uh, is there, are they uh, having a panic attack? Honestly, is there some, you know, psych history that's relevant to the, um, to the overall clinical picture? Orthopnea, so that's, you know, uh, uh, um, a difficulty breathing or dyspnea in a, typically a lying down position, um, often associated as is pedal edema with forms of heart failure. You know, orthopnea can, can well be, you know, left heart failure. Uh, pedal edema is more right heart failure. Sometimes those forms of right heart failure and left heart failure occur concomitantly. Oh, actually, even like left heart failure can contribute to the, to the formation of right heart failure and vice versa. Um, feigning spells, palpitations, past medical history and history of heart disease, things that I've just mentioned, physical exam, unexplained tachycardia, hypotension, and, you know, again, the, the other, um, you know, uh, symptoms that I've just, I've just uh, indicated. Diaphoresis, you know, there's no such thing as um, patient has a little bit of diaphoresis. Diaphoresis is profuse sweating, and, th and that, that's not explained uh, otherwise. A jugular venous distension, JVD, right? So when that right pump, the right heart is backing up, the individual has an element of right heart failure. The jugular veins will become engorged because of the backup in the fluid in the blood uh, and the backup of the pressure, causing them to distend, if you will. Limitations of ECGs or AKGs, they do not measure the pumping ability of the heart. For that, you need a cardiac ultrasound or other, or other tests. Um, does not show abnormalities in the cardiac structure. So crude abnormalities, such as um, cardiomegaly, an enlarged heart can actually be visualized um, on a chest x-ray via the cardiac silhouette, okay? But again, those are really crude indications. The um, cardiac ultrasound would be one of the elements that would clearly show um, these you know, abnormalities in the structure. Um, results from the cath lab, likewise, would, would uh, you know, reveal those as well. ECGs do not have a predictive value. Um, that's largely true. I won't say that it's 100% true, but for the sake of this review and this conversation, it is. It's also artifact. You know, you, you get um, patients that are hooked up to an ECG or hooked up to a, you know, a, a code cart, um, but, but it's in test mode, you know, and the test mode is showing, you know, asystole or some lethal rhythm, but the patient looks absolutely fine. They're speaking complete sentences. They're not complaining at all. So again, artifact or the leads were put on incorrectly. You know, there's a whole host of things. So kind of artifact, operator technique, they're not the same thing, but they overlap. Lead placement uh, limitations um, and technical issues. Those last four, again, they're not exactly the same thing, um, but they're certainly re uh, related where there's not, you know, where the procedure basically wasn't done right. Um, and maybe it couldn't have been done right because of some sort of, you know, an issue with the patient. 
um, they have ch chest trauma or something along those lines. The analysis. So I like to say that the analysis is done in a stepwise fashion, just like when you guys uh, prepare for the ACCS exam, you should do it in an organized stepwise fashion. Don't get overwhelmed. The advice I alluded to this earlier, the advice um, that I would have for you guys is, you know, start as you review, start with the areas that you interpret that you're weakest in. And, and I don't mean to say that you're weak in all of the topics that we're going over today, but some of the discrete pharmacology, some of the discrete lab values, um, you know, things like hemodynamic monitoring and how to respond to some of that hemodynamic monitoring um, as, uh, you know, uh, as is covered in some of our other lectures to the ACCS prep. So the stepwise process, you know, start with, is there something we need to respond to right away? Is there a lethal rhythm requiring immediate attention? Patient is, you know, they're not feeling right at all. They're not passed out, or maybe they are. The point is you put, they put the, the leads on the patient and there's clearly something that warrants ventricular fibr fibrillation that warrants, you know, prompt defibrillation. Um, is the rate normal, slow, or fast? Is the rhythm regular? Regular. So I'll talk about this a little bit more, but one of the leading causes for an <clears throat> a, uh, irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation. Again, we'll talk about that uh, as I present uh, and proceed further through this presentation. Is there a P, as in Peter, is there a P wave? What is the PR interval? So there's uh, first degree heart, heart block is, I say simply, everything is simple if you know it, but is simply a prolonged PR interval. I'll drill down more on that. What is the QRS configuration? Is it widened? And broadly speaking, if it's widened, wide QRS is typically not a great finding. Doesn't mean the patient's going to die, but it's typically not a great finding. Are there other characteristics such as ST depression? Remember, a STEMI is ST elevation. ST depression can be associated um, with, you know, ischemic heart, you know, heart issues such as angina or angina, however you choose to say it. Is there an access deviation, which we can see with various forms of heart failure and, and um, again, cardiomegaly, when the structure of the heart actually changes? That pathway, the conducting pathway for those electrical impulses changes. What is the final interpretation? And as important, what is or are the recommended action or treatments? Little bit on the big boxes versus little boxes. You know, the, the big boxes account for a fifth of a second or 0 0.20 seconds the little boxes are 0.04 seconds. No one's gonna ask you on the ACCS exam or hopefully you know, any reasonable exam you know, to, to calculate or estimate the heart rate based on you know, just counting these little boxes and multiplying times 0.2, whatever. These boxes, however, can come in handy in estimating. So you're not actually counting, but I'll share with you um, some little tricks on how to, um, if, if, if the, actual heart rate is not displaying, which it will in most cases, um, how to closely, you know, estimate or calculate the heart rate. So estimating the rate, if it's regular, pick a complex that falls on about or on a heavy line, you know, such as that first uh, up pointing arrow. And then you count one, two, three, almost four. Okay, almost four large boxes, okay. So if it's one large box between, you know, from that where the upward arrow is on this slide, okay? And then if you look kind of near the top there, it says three, one large box would be a heart rate of 300, very bad, okay? What I'm saying, but if it's approaching that, it's a little more than that, so it's in the 200s, very bad, okay? Um, if it's two large boxes, it's 150, okay? That may be something like St. Sinus tachycardia, or it could be on the threshold of, the patient, um, you know, being in some sort of a supraventricular tachycardic rhythm, which we'll talk about. If it's three large boxes, it's 100, and so on. About four large boxes. It's not quite in this case, but we're saying it's approximately, the heart rate in this case is approximately 75 to 80. 
So you pick, pick a complex that falls in a heavy line, estimate the rate by counting the number of heavy boxes using the 300, 150, blah, blah, blah guideline. So actually calculating, this is just a little bit more elaboration on the preceding slide, count the number of large boxes between beats, divide the number into 300 examples, two large boxes, you get the idea, 150, 75, 50, et cetera. Normal ECG or EKG, really looking, you know, normal, it's, its rate is about, you know, 60, certainly in that range of 60 to 100. The PR interval, so the normal PR interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. So what they're really saying here is, you know, pretty much the longest that PR interval should be is one large box. And again, I'll, I'll talk later about a first degree heart block, but first degree heart block again is just elongated where that PR interval is longer than 0 0.20 seconds. QRS, should be less than or equal to 0.12 seconds. Arrhythmia etiology. Etiology has to you know, do with their kind of the root cause. So this is a disturbance in automaticity, okay? The heart has its own pacemaker. It can be alone, certainly receives signals from the autonomic you know, aspect of the central nervous system. But, um, I'll share with you quickly an example. My first experience with uh, the automaticity of a heart was I'm a avid, avid saltwater fisherman, and I have been since I've been in, I don't know, eight or 10 years old. And we caught a large, my neighbor caught a large striped bass. We put it on ice, we, we cleaned it, put it on ice, brought it home. And being an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old, we, um, we, we basically um, were, were playing with it on the garage floor. It was still iced up. And we took the, the heart was still in there. We took the heart and we pressed on it on the garage floor and it started beating and we freaked out. We're like, what the heck? You know, so it was my first experience that this heart, this striped bass heart, but it applies to you know all animals. This striped bass heart had it, its own pacemaker. And because it was iced up, the tissue was still viable. So there's a so there's a disturbance in the internal pacemaker. Pacemaker speeds up, new pacemaker takes over. There's a conduction problem or conducting problem, slowing or blockage of the conduction or electrical pulse, or there's a combination of the two. So now let's look at the dysrhythmias. We talked a lot about anatomy. We talked a bit about um, you know normal what what occurs normal. Let, let's look at what what's what's uh, you know abnormal. So why the, why this particular strip? is uh, a sinus br uh, bradycardia. It's regular, that's the good news. However, the rate is less than 60. The rate is less than 60. There's one P for every QRS, one P for every QRS. That's a good thing. The less than 60, eh, depends, depends how much less than 60. The PRI, the PR interval is indeed between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20 seconds. The QRS width is within the guidelines of 0 0.12 seconds. Common causes can be an, a myocardial infarction, an MI, where the, the part of the myocardium that's been affected, okay, is in the upper portion of the heart. And it's, uh, it's affecting, you know, the, that, that SA node or the transmission of the, single, of the signal from the SA node down to the AV and beyond. And think about this for a moment. A myocardial infarction in its purest sense is the heart, a, a, a bit of the heart tissue has died, okay? And it's scarred over. And it's not just that the myocardium is no longer, uh, again, contracting the way it should. It's everything going through it. The nerves, the uh, electrical impulses are disturbed in some way or are actually blocked altogether. So again, myocardial infarction, particularly ones that would, would affect the transmission of the signal from the AV node. Vagal stimulation. So you're suctioning a patient, hit the carina, you're doing a carotid a massage, that sort of thing. Increased ICP, not a good finding because it's um, suggestive that the part of the brain that accounts for the automaticity of the heart has been interfered with. Okay, so not, not a good finding. 
normal athletic heart. So my normal heart rate is, um, when, when I, if, you know, right now I'm presenting, so it's probably in the 60s, but if I'm just really relaxing, it's normally in the 50s. Uh, if I try real hard, and I mean that, I do biofeedback, I get it down to about 50. I was a swimmer in college, and one of the guys that I swam with in the offseason, he was a runner. So he ran, he was just, you know, he was, just a, he was an animal. Um, his resting heart rate was in the upper 30s. And when I say there was nothing wrong with him, you know, we were college students, so we did a lot of silly things, whatever. But there was nothing wrong with him that wasn't wrong with us when we were in college. Um, and again, in the range of 37, 38, 39 was his normal resting heart rate. Treatment, maybe nothing if it's asymptomatic. Atropine, and now the dosing on atropine, if you've taken ACLS recently, it at one point, not so long ago, went down to 0.5 uh, milligrams. Now it's back up to, for an initial dose, 1.0 for an adult. And again, I'll go over that briefly when I go over pharmacology. Pacing. So pacing is, you know, the, is the, um, the, the, the answer, <clears throat> pardon me, the non-pharmacologic answer that they're actually looking for. You can pace externally or they can pace a patient internally. They may actually end up needing an actual pacemaker. Uh, so an implanted pacemaker. Sinus tachycardia, why the heart rate's between 100 and 150, so it's north of 100, but it's, you know, 150 or less. Rhythm and intervals are okay. Common causes hypovolemia, fever, pain, anxiety, uh, activity, you know, um, aerobic activity, catecholamine. So someone's very sensitive to albuterol or some of the older um, some pathomimetics such as alupent or ones that have actually preceded isopril that have preceded, you know, drugs that, yeah, I mean, we still obviously use a lot of albuterol, but some of those other alupaint, pent, not commonly used, isopril pretty much not used in this country for bronchodilation, you know, et cetera. But you think about it, um, some patients do respond in this manner to even albuterol and their heart rate can, uh, can increase. Um, the, the treatment would be treating the underlying causes if the patient, you know, has anxiety, if they're in pain, et cetera, if they need a, a fluid bolus, uh, because there's less, you know, if the patient's dehydrated, they're going to have less blood volume, plain and simple, you know, be, because of the, you know, that some of that fluid is going to be, um, if, you know, if you will diffuse out of the, the, the blood supply and just, in, in, you know, elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, so, so sinus tachycardia, that's somewhat benign, you know, we're, we're certainly concerned if they're dehydrated or, you know, if they're in pain. Um, but the significance of the 150 goes like this. So for adults, when the heart rate increases much above 150, 160-ish, 165, some books say even 170, that's when actually cardiac output starts dropping, okay? So the heart's beating faster. The heart accounts for crudely, accounts for about 25% of the oxygen uptake in the entire body. But when this happens, when, you know, when the heart rate starts you know, in increasing above, you know, 150, 160, 170, cardiac output is dropping. Think about it. The oxygen uptake is increasing, but oxygen delivery to the tissues is decreasing. That's a bad combination. So what does the body do? It may increase the heart rate further. So again, the 150, this is a relatively benign form of tachycardia, but when we traverse to other forms that we'll talk about momentarily, it can be very problematic. Superventricular tachycardia, SVT. Why? Very rapid heart rate, 150 to 250. P wave may be buried, so it probably exists, but it's buried in the preceding T wave because the rate is so fast. PRI in interval is difficult to measure, but may be normal if it was measurable. Common causes ischemic heart disease, excessive catecholamines, but we're really talking about ones that have a lot of uh, beta 1. So, you know, drugs like epinephrine. Treatment, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and adenosine would be one, uh, another one as well. And again, taking the ACCS exam, I'm thinking they're going to have, you know, they want you to kind of know some of these basic rate controller drugs. We'll go over them when we talk about pharmacology, but just, you know, good to at a minimum be able to identify what some of these drugs are in these categories. That's an area that you could spend some time as you study for the exam on you know, exploring, reviewing, and um, better understanding if you don't already. Atrial fibrillation, talked about this briefly earlier. Why? 
no identifiable or discernible P as in Peter waves. Chaotic, irregular baseline. QRS is distinguishable, but irregular. And it's less than 0.12 seconds. Common causes an enlarged atrium, perhaps due to CHF, perhaps due to mit uh, mitral stenosis with regurgitation. Clinical si significance. So it goes like this. So think about this, the lub dub. You know, even if you never went to respiratory school, if you're a nurse, never went to nursing school, whatever, the lub dub, the lub dub happens. You know, basically there's just co coordinated contraction and relaxation of the atria and the in the ventricles. Okay. When that gets threatened, all right, when the atria are not no longer coordinating with the ventricles, you actually lose what's called what's called the atrial kick. The atrial kick. So cardiac output is going to drop crudely around 15%, 10 to 20%. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing is the threat of emboli. So you have a decrease in cardiac output, eh, typically not life-threatening, but maybe noticeable. The real, the real problem um, is the threat of emboli. So you have blood that's in the atria that's circulating. Meaning all of it is not going, because of the, the lack of love dub, the coordination between the top and the bottom of the heart, you have some of that blood remaining in the atria that should be going to the ventricles. And it's pooling goes around and around and around, think like a whirlpool. And what can happen, we know demonstrably can happen, is, is emboli can form. So blood clots can form. Those blood clot, clots can end up in a pulmonary artery, can end up in the brain. So the patient is at, exposed for or at risk for uh, ischemic stroke, they're at risk for PE. So it can be very problematic. So a lot of those patients uh, routinely should be anticoagulated, which is all, which is, which is pretty much the, you know, that we want to control the rate. Okay. So there's other things that can be done, but ultimately um, you don't want, well, you know, if they, if they relapse back into atrial fibrillation, you don't want these, these emboli to form. The problem with that is now their their blood is thinner, and if they fall, they're now at re, at re risk for a hemorrhagic stroke, particularly if they're older. So just you know, it's one of those cost benefit analysis types of things. Treatment: beta blockers. I mentioned low pressure. That's not the only one. Chal uh, calcium channel blockers such as cardizum, digoxin is an older drug. It's it, it's. Uh, it's therapeutic index, meaning the relationship between the safe and the effective dose is a little close. It's, it's not a, it's a safe drug, but not as safe as some others, okay? So, you know, digoxin is still used, but there's a lot of other medications that are out there now um, that are superior. Cardioversion, so we are actually trying to, you know, convert the patient out, trying to kind of, if you will, shock uh, at, a, at a low, you know, a, you know, a low uh, voltage shock the atria into resuming normalcy. Atrial flutter. So notice that the rate is somewhat irregular, maybe not quite as irregular as it is in atrial fibrillation. Baseline is not chaotic, it's sawtooth. Um, what I want you to know, so recognizing it, but the treatment, you know, some of the causes, notice rheumat rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic fever, um, can be, you know, can can be a cause in this case, but the other causes, if you rule out rheumatic, you know, the same causes that can cause atrial fibrillation can contribute uh, to atrial flutter. Likewise, likewise, the treatments are are quite similar. PVCs, premature ventricular contraction or contractions. I'm going to talk about the strips in a minute, but just give me a little bit of latitude. Let's look at the why. So the premature beat makes the rhythm appear irregular. PVC is not, not preceded by a P wave. PRI, therefore, is not measurable. Common causes, hypokalemia. So hypo and hyperkalemia are a big deal because they can not, not just result in um, if you will, skeletal muscle weakness, but they can also screw up the action potential of the heart. So those electrical impulses within the myocardium are generated by the exchange of positively and negatively charged ions. Okay. And one of those, you know, one of those substances is in fact calcium. So hypokalemia 
it can can absolutely cause you know contribute to or cause PVCs and other dysrhythmias. The the, the reason why I'm staying on hypokalemia is some of the medications either that we give or that our patients are on, our respiratory patients are on, including albuterol, can contribute to or cause hypokalemia. Just be kind of aware of that. And then again, Terry talked about lab values, but for most of the books, the low end of uh, for serum, um, you know, uh, uh, serum uh, um, potassium, serum potassium is uh, 3.5. The upper range for most of the textbooks is 5.0 or low, you know, 5.1, 5.2. So when that uh, potassium, potassium drops below 3.5, it can be problematic. If we're given, you know, uh, three albuterol treatments to a patient who already has dysrhythmia, and then recently they maybe they had some some blood taken and their uh, potassium was already, you know, 3.4, and you know, just it's something to be aware of. An MI or ischemia can also cause it. Hypoxemia, hypovolemia can as well. So treatment, treating the analyzing when caused, beta blockers, and anti-dysrhythmic or anti-arrhythmic drugs, such as lidocaine or amiodarone, amiodarone. Now back to the strips. The upper strip shows that second beat there is a downward deflection. It's showing you, again, a unifocal, PVC, unifocal, meaning there's only one PVC and it's the, the shape is what it is. On the second line down, there's, it looks like actually a total of three PVCs, okay, three PVCs. And the problem is, if you look at the first one and the last one, one, one is an upward deflection and a widening of the QRS. The one that's you know, all the way on the right-hand side is a downward reflection, uh, deflection and a widening. So that tells you, that tells you that the, um, the PVCs are multifocal, meaning they're emanating from more than one portion of the conducting system of the heart. So it's disturbing. It's more disturbing than a patient who has occasional PVCs that are unifocal, that, that all are similar. Um, versus one. So the, the severity of PVCs is judged in a lot of ways by experts that have, you know, a lot more experience than this than I do. But what some of the criteria include, how frequent are they? And are they unifocal or multifocal? Um, the other thing too is uh, um, when you look at ventricular tachycardia in its, in its root cause or root form is basically continuous PVCs, continuous PVCs. Speaking of which, ventricular tachycardia, why, why? Uh, the rate generally between 100 and 200, although patients can have a, you know, again, a, a rate lower than 100, but typically, they're, you know, they're tachycardia, superventricular tachycardia. P waves not present, PRI is therefore not measurable. The QRS wide and bizarre greater than 0.12 seconds. Common causes are similar to PVCs for the reasons I just mentioned, and treatment. Now, if the patient has a pulse and stable, I should have put stable in quotes. So a patient that's in ventricular tachycardia by definition is not stable. Okay, let me say, so, so I know it sounds like double speak. What I really, really mean there is stable in that they're conscious. They probably say they feel funny, I don't feel right, okay? But they have a pulse. And then the treatment would be similar to anti-dysrhythmic drugs such, you know, that we would give for PVCs like amiodarone and lidocaine. They're not the only two, but they're still the most common ones that are actually given. If the patient is quote unquote stable and has a pulse in ventricular tachycardia and we don't intercede promptly, there is a strong likelihood that they will become unstable, meaning that they will lose consciousness and will be, you know, hooking them up to, you know, to defibrillator, beginning CPR, compressions, you know, breathing for them, whether it's through back valve mask or intubation or LMA or whatever. If they're pulseless, then immediately begin CPR with rapid uh, defibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, why? It's chaotic. Um, again, sometimes uh, you can get, this is coarse ventricular fibrillation, of course, versus fine 
which is just much finer than what you have here. Maybe in that, and the just just to the right hand side there, there's looks like you know there's a it's a little bit finer, but some of it can be very very fine. When I took ACLS last time, they gave us this rhythm that was almost looked like asystole, and I told the instructor, you shouldn't do this. It's not 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 that they did it personally. It was from the American Heart Association, but it's just like you're not really testing our knowledge when it looks very it looks really kind of close to asystole. But in any event, let's not go there. This is coarse ventricular fibrillation. Why it's chaotic. Heart rate um, cannot be determined. P waves or PRI and QRS are not discernible. Causes uh, myocardial infarction or ischemia, acidosis, hypothermia, hypoxemia. So the ABCs or the CABs of ACLS, including immediate defibrillation, would be the direction that you would go. And you know, likewise, likewise, you think about your H's and your T's. Okay, we'll talk about them in a few slides. Uh, but asystole. You're looking at causes, electrolyte disturbances, pneumothorax, drug overdose, hypoxemia or hypoxia, and post-MI. This is not a shockable rhythm, despite what we all see on, you know, TV, these shows. Like, you're going to jumpstart your car. You know, going to connect to a battery and you know, give them a jolt. You know, I've actually been in, you know, I've been in the field about 30-something years. And I have had cases where, you know, one of the old-time doctors said, let's just give them a shock. And, you know, I've never seen it work, whatever. Um, treatment is always non-shockable, just to be clear on that. Immediate CPR, unless there's a valid DNI, DNR, identif uh, identify and treat the underlying causes. Pacing, basic troubleshooting would be included as well. The H's and T's, I stole this from um, American Heart Association and a bunch of other books, including uh, probably, I, I actually uh, edit, um, I author slash edit the ECG chapters in, in uh, two of my books. Um, I, I, part of the reason why I did it was when I graduated from respiratory school, I really didn't feel like I had a decent understanding of ECGs or EKGs, um, and I kind of forced myself to. Um, my wife is a, a cardiac nurse, so she has a better, um, she has much her skill set when it comes to ECGs is, is better than mine. But I made it a point to get myself to a particular point. And again, H's and T's that account for uh, can account for actually asystole, but also atrial fibrillation. Uh, familiarize yourself with these. So the H's, you know, hypovolemia, any of you ACLS folks, um, you guys have had, you know, had to know this in some way, shape or form, you know, um, hypovolemia, hypoxia, again, some forms of uh, acidosis, hyper hypokalemia, hypothermia, uh, the T's tamponade. So, you know, tamponade, uh, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis, uh, whether it's a coronary, so MI, or whether it's pulmonary, and then a drug overdose uh, would be another example. First degree heart block, again, what makes it first degree heart block is what's bolded here. The PRI uh, is greater than 20 seconds. Um, causes physiologic interference with the conducting pathways. And think about it, there's something, it's getting through, but it's delayed, okay? There's perhaps some injury um, to that, you know, to the tissue surrounding that particular pathway. Another cause is dig toxicity. So digoxin is a drug that can be used to treat some of these dysrhythmias, some of the ones I mentioned earlier. The problem is, is that serum levels need to be measured very carefully and that the treatment can actually contribute to other forms of dysrhythmias, in this case, such as first degree heart block. Treatment, it may be benign. So, so if it's slightly, uh, if you will, elongated, that PRI or PR interval, um, maybe we're just going to monitor. If it's very much so and a patient has any symptoms, then they're going to be you know, treated in some manner. If this the suspected cause is dig toxicity, then they're going to stop dig and uh, replace it with another uh, you know dys dysrhythmic uh, uh, treatment drug. Second degree, there's two forms of second degree. You guys should probably remember that either from whatever, from your clinical experience, from your ACLS, whatever. Uh, Winky Bach. Um, let's you know the name. So you know, longer, longer, longer drop. Now you got a Winky Bach. So. The PRI interval gets more elongated, more elongated, more elongated until a QRS is dropped. So that's that was my cut into the chase here. But why? So it's irregular rhythm. Ventricular rate is less than the atrial rate. Progressive prolongation of the PRI interval until one's actually dropped, which is another way of saying what I said earlier. Causes MI or ischemia, excessive beta blockers, dig toxicity, treatment, Atropine, if the patient's symptomatic and has a heart rate less than 60, uh, monitoring the patient uh, carefully. Second degree heart block type 2, MOBITS 2, some of the books say. Why? 
uh, it's reg it's a regular rhythm. So ventricular rate is less than the atrial rate. QRS does not occur with every P wave. Some QRSs are dropped. More P waves than QRS. The difference between the first type and the second type is, in this case, there's no gradual prolongation. It's just once it's dropped, you know, a, a QRS is just dropped. Not it's not preceded by this longer uh, prolongation. Causes MI. So you can kind of see this the parallelism here. Excessive beta blockers. So we were treating them, but we, you know, got a little little too too. Not we ourselves, but the the team, the, the physicians, PAs, and the nurse practitioners. Digit toxicity treatment, atropine, if symptomatic, heart rate, and uh, pacemaker. So you know, the treatments are quite similar between first and second, but the the actual way they manifest themselves are not. Third degree. So again, before I kind of review this slide, what's happening physiologically? is the atria, so the, the two, you know, the, the tops of the heart there are two top chambers, and the ventricles had, a, one of my colleagues says, had a divorce. They divorced one another. <laughs> they, what I'm saying is they're not coordinating. They're, there's no coordination between what's happening in the top. The love dub, forget about it. No more love, no more love dub. It's just not, it's not happening. Why? Independent atrial P waves and ventricular activity. The atrial rate is always faster than the ventricular rate. Heart rate is often less than, less than. Really what they're talking about is the QRS, less than 40. PRI, not measurable. QRS may be greater than 0.12 seconds. Causes, MI, ischemia, or ditch toxicity. Treatment, atropine, pacemaker. If the cause is not ditch toxicity, this is not, not a good finding. It's not a good thing. Third degree heart block. It means it's a sick heart. And again, if you, if you uh, eliminate uh, other uh, etiology, again, such as ditch toxicity, which can be fixed, if it's something, it, you know, pathology within the heart, within the body itself, not a good finding. Many of these uh, candidates or many of these individuals are candidates for LVADs or even heart transplantation. Idioventricular rhythm, why? So it's, you know, etoptic foci takes over as the pacemaker for the ventricles. There's no P waves. So notice no P waves. It's a slow rate, although there's such a thing as an idioventricular, accelerated idioventricular. And the QRS is widened. And it, this is an, another example of a sick heart. So no P waves, widened QRS, the rate is low, 30 to 40. Strongly suggestive that the Purkinje network may well have taken over. Uh, common causes, MI, treatment, pacing, atropine. These patients are almost universally um, asymptomatic. ST elevation with a PVC, so causes MI, a STEMI. ST elevation, MI is STEMI, what STEMI stands for here. And you can see a couple of examples here where there's a P, uh, PVCs, multiple PVCs, but the ones where there's not PVCs, you just see that ST elevation. Um, TPA, so TPA is stands for tissue plasminogen activator. I don't think that the MBRC is going to ask you what's TPA, but they they want you to know that streptokinase is is one of you know one of the forms of TPA. So it's you know it's it's not as commonly given here. And I say here, I I, I know Terry and I were joking. I'm a Jersey boy, so we happen to have. I'm about 30, 40 miles from New York City, but even in Northern New Jersey, we have a lot of hospitals that are fairly close to one another. Good hospitals. You know, we call tertiary care, quaternary care hospitals that have cath labs, have, you know, active cardiac surgery units, things along those lines. We're well aware, and I mean this endearingly, we're well aware that we're probably very fortunate in this respect and that many parts of the world and this country, that's not the case, okay? Um, a, a relative of mine lived in Northern California and was in fact having an MI. And you're going to laugh, but it just uh, it wasn't like you call 911 and they're there in five minutes. Drove himself to a clinic where there was a nurse practitioner that in fact confirmed he was having an MI and they gave him TPA. There, were, there was no, you know, there, there was no, um, you know, getting him to a hospital. I mean, he was conscious. I, I guess if he was unconscious, they might have gotten a chopper in there or whatever. But he was obviously still conscious, could drive himself, not, not, not advised. It was not an advised move. 
Um, it worked out for him. They gave him TPA. And the nurse said to him, I remember, I was fascinated by the story. The nurse said to him, uh, nurse practitioner said, uh, when I give you this, you're going to feel flush. And if it's going to work, you're going to know, you know, soon. You're going to feel weird, right? Um, but if it's going to work, you're going to know in, you know, a minute, uh, two minutes, you're going to know pretty quickly. And he was very fortunate that his chest pain minutes later was, went from a, a nine to a one to a two. Um, and it, it worked for him. Again, TPA is going to be, you think about this, if the individual has any proclivity towards bleeding anywhere in their brain, anywhere else, TPA can be, you know, it's actually, if, if there's any known risk along those lines, it can be uh, um, ruled out for that. Uh, but it's one of the treatments for the, you know, for someone that's having an MI, uh, vasodilators, revascularization, whether it's, well, revascularization literally would mean going to, for surgery. Um, but, you know, in the cath lab, they can open up that artery or those arteries, um, you know, and, and do it quickly. They can um, many times not eliminate, but reduce the amount of, of myocardium that's either injured or um, that dies as a result of EMI. Now we're switching over here to watching our time here to um, end title CO2. So this, this overall lecture is probably a little bit, you know, it's probably two thirds ECGs, one third or so end title, but we're making that shift to end title CO2. So some of the objectives we're gonna look at over the next 20 minutes or so, explain indications, illustrate some of the equipment that's used, briefly, briefly review some of the related research, define, you know, normal, easy, you know, end tidal CO2, both values and, and waveforms, define or look at some abnormal ones, identify the different waveforms, and of course, furnish you guys with additional resources. So some of the related terminology, capnography has to, you know, capnography, it's the graphic depiction, capnometry, capnometry is the number. And you can imagine that many of these, uh, not imagine, but you can actually see in a clinical uh, uh, scenario where a lot of these monitors will give you both. So they give you the waveform, they give you what the value is. Colorimetry is what you might have in some of your intubation boxes where it's, you know, it's this color change thing. It's not giving you, you know, the number. Um, it's not even giving you the graphical depiction, but it's telling you that if there's good color change, that it's measuring a demonstrable amount of CO2 and strongly suggesting, not confirming, strongly suggesting that in the case of intubation, that the ET tube is in the correct place if you have good color change. Less reliable than waveform. In CPR, if no circulation, little or no CO2 is reaching the alveoli, so there may be little color change. You know, if it's high color, it may stay yellow after the, in the initial change. So it's not, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. To be clear, that uh, end tidal CO2 with waveform is the standard of care during CPR and during intubation where it's available. So if this, if a code is occurring in, you know, a, a, in a hospital setting, particularly a tertiary care or quaternary care hospital, uh, you know, your larger hospitals, the it's expected that, um, you know, your end tidal CO2 will be uh, monitored during CPR and uh, during intubation. Why do we monitor and, you know, who? Immediately following intubation, best way to confirm two placement during CPR due to the effectiveness of compressions and ventilation. We'll talk more about that. Monitor mechanically ventilated patients, especially you know, if they're weaning, especially if they're acutely ill and maybe apt to be retaining CO2, as we saw with COVID, but we've seen through the years with you know, ARDS and various forms of, of respiratory failure. Um, transporting patients is also you know, critically important as well. Patients at risk for hypoventilation, your neuromuscular patients, pretty much, it's not pretty much, the standard of care for moderate sedation, what we used to call conscious sedation, uh, among other things, some of your um, non-intubated uh, bronch, uh, you know, bronchoscopy patients receive moderate sedation. Pretty much the standard of care is to monitor their end tidal CO2 uh, if, in fact, um, they're receiving such, you know, you know, such form of sedation. Newer indications, so capnography, say newer, it's not new, but, you know, looking at the, to assess the, the effectiveness of chest compressions, the, the more effective, all, if all else is constant, the more effective the chest compressions, the more CO2 is returning back to the lungs to participate in gas exchange and to be uh, exhaled and monitored and measured on via capnography. 
early detection of the return of spontaneous cardiac activity or ROSC and objective data for the decision perhaps to cease resuscitation. A little more data. I tend to not like dichotomous measurements. You know, oh, if it's greater than this, it's this. If it's less than this, it's this. So just a little bit of latitude here. Okay. CPR quality. So just kind of suspend your disbelief for a minute and just say, in general, if end tidal CO2 is less than 15, particularly if it's much less than 15, if it's eight, it's correlated, or if all else is constant, it's correlated with not high quality CPR. If it's greater than 15, particularly much so, it's associated with better CPR or return to ROSC. ROSC, so if the end tidal increases suddenly by 10 or 15, and if it's maintained, you know, uh, 35, a 40, or even higher. And this is just, again, a graphical depiction of what you actually might see. You know, over time, um, you see, you know, basically um, you're in that, uh, I'm, I'm interpolating here, but it looks like it's around, you know, 10, 12, maybe a little higher than that, you know, 15. And then all of a sudden, end tidal CO2 drops up to like, or raises up to like 50. And notice it actually goes up high, and then it kind of winds down to maybe 40. The reason why it's it's going way up there is because there's been this accumulation of CO2, and now that the heart has started to kick in, it's circulating blood better, and that CO2, you know, the higher level of CO2 is making it back to the lungs, you know, to, to the, the, the alveolar capillary membrane, uh, to the lungs to be exhaled and measured. Normal values, normal range, you know, we know pH 7.35, 7.45, uh, normal end tidal CO2, 30 to 43. Normal PaCO2 is 35 to 45. So just note that in, within normal ranges, the end tidal CO2 is three to, you know, two, you know, three to two, two to five, three to five, something along those lines, difference lower. The little, the little uh, you know, nudge on that is <clears throat> that it's not linear. Notice at the lower end of the scale, the difference is about five. At the upper end of the scale, it's more like two. Uh, but just remember in general, within those ranges, those normal ranges, end tidal tends to be lower. So as you're monitoring your, um, your, your patients that are weaning from mechanical ventilation, if the end tidal goes up from you know, 40 to 50, the PaCO2 may actually be north of 50. Our response to abnormal CO2. So looking at, you know, how do we stabilize abnormal uh, end tidal CO2 values by adjusting the minute ventilation? Um, if the end tidal is high, in increasing ventilation. If it's low, decreasing ventilation. MBRC in the ACCS exam will expect you on mechanically ventilated patients to make recommendations. So you have, whether it's a PaCO2 or an end tidal CO2. Okay, if they give it to you and there's nothing funky, assume the end tidal CO2 is an accurate measurement, all right? If it's high, patients on mechanical ventilation and they, they want you to increase the minute ventilation. You, sometimes people scratch their head and say, do I incre increase the tidal volume or the respiratory rate, all right? If the respiratory rate the patient is getting is already at the high end, it's at eight, nine mLs per kg, okay? And the rate is lower, it's 12, 15, 16, and you have room to go up, and there's no evidence of things like auto peep or whatever, then you'd work the respiratory rate in that case. If the respiratory rate is already 20 or 22, but the tidal volume is lower and you have the ability, and I, I the ability meaning you the, the plateau pressures and driving pressures, plateau pressure is what it is, driving pressure is difference between the peep and plateau, if they can take it, we want our driving pressures to be less than 15. We want our plateau pressures to be 30 or less. So if you have room to go up on the tidal volume when the rate is already high, do so. If they don't give you plateau pressure or driving pressure, assume it's okay. Assume that you have, and I know what to say about assuming, but you can assert that you probably have room to go up on a low tidal volume when you need to blow off some of that CO2 if the rate is already high. So they're gonna, they're gonna just gotta read the questions carefully and you should be, you should be okay. Example of a normal catenogram. 
So just gonna you know, kind of show you, it doesn't quite plateau off perfectly, but it's relatively flat, a little bit of an up ramp, but relatively flat on top there. A little bit, so you have, you're getting some entitled CO2 here. It's less, it's less, and you know, with the passage of time, you can expect it to be nothing. So I'm very concerned here. I'm thinking that possible missed intubation. So you got a little CO2 on that first breath, didn't get, so when uh, the, the ET tube is in the esophagus, little or no CO2 is present. Again, in the first breath, there may be some in there, but then it, it diminishes. Normal capnogram is best indication of proper ET tube placement. What do you have here? So you actually have a well-formed, and then you have one up-ramping, then you have, it's up-ramping even more. It's not plateauing, not, you know, so you're thinking what you're thinking, that it's some sort of an obstruction, partially kinked or narrowed artificial airway present of a, of a foreign body. Now, not to say you can you know, look at the end title and say, oh, gee, you know, it's it's like if you see this waveform and the patient's, you know, on a, a ventilator and the high pressure, you know, the high pressure alarm is sounding and you're not getting back all of your tidal volumes, et cetera, then you can, you know, assert that there's something up, there's some blockage, there's a mucus plug, it's kinked, whatever. Presence of a foreign body in the airway, obstruction, the expiratory limb of the breathing circuit, uh, bronchospasm. Bronchospasm, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this more a little, a little later as I wind down this presentation, is more like a shark fin. So it's, again, you're not going to say, oh, the patient is asthmatic because I see a shark fin, but it's surprising how many times you see this patient who's in status asthmaticus, they're intubated, maybe get continuous albuterol heal, with heliox, without heliox, whatever, and you see the shark fin. It's almost like confirming what you already, you know, what the index of suspicion was for, but you would never diagnose bronchospasm just strictly based on a, a waveform. Inadequate seal. So this is sort of the opposite where, you know, it ramps up okay, but then at, at peak uh, airway pressure, you have a leak. So leaky or uncuffed endotracheal tube for the sake of our adults, it's going to be leaky because we're, we don't use un, uncuffed endotracheal tubes in the adult population. Uh, artificial airway, that's too small. So we're using on a very large male, we're using a 7.0 ET tube. It's got a lot of pressure in it. But despite that, because the patient's a, a large person, they're tall, um, it, 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 on peak insp inspiratory uh, pressure, it's leaking. A little bit. So we see a rise over time. And again, this is, this is showing you three breaths, but it's really illustrating over a period of time. So decrease in minute ventilation, the patient's retaining CO2, increase in metabolic rate, they're producing more CO2, rapid rise in body temperature, their metabolism has gotten up, and then you have some less common. And all I'm going to say about the, the less common is, you know, absorption of insufflated CO2, when they're doing laparoscopic surgery, they pump the belly up with CO2. Yeah, they, in fact, they evacuate it, but there's some of that CO2 is still in there, and it, you know, it diffuses, uh, eventually finding its way to the bloodstream. Release of a tourniquet, you think about what's going on with a tourniquet, all this anaerobic um, you know, the, the anaerobic metabolism, the CO2 is building up when it's released. You're going to all, you know, all that CO2 that was building up in there is now going back, you know, hopefully to the lungs and being measured in this manner. Much less common. The Really, the, you know, the first three would really be what I'd focus on. The other direction, increase in respiratory rate, increase in tidal volume, decrease in, you know, it's really kind of take the preceding slide and reverse it. And then this, this is just elaborating a little bit more, but you know, you get the, the, the end tidal CO2 is rising from 37 to 45 approximately. And really the MS here is morphine sulfate for pain. If the patient is naive, they don't normally take uh, any sort of narcotics. Um, you know, it's to totally possible that, that a fairly low dose of five milligrams of, of morphine may actually, you know, could, could result in hypoventilation. Causes of elevated, CO2, just kind of like recapping metabolism. So overdose, malignant hyperthermia, circulatory issues such as increased cardiac output with constant ventilation. Um, really, you know, think of the metabolic things. Um, respiratory system, respiratory insufficiency, respiratory depression, uh, obstructive lung disease. Equipment, again, defective exhalation valve. What do you see? You know, exhalation valve, maybe if you use uh, your, your, your um, LTV vents, um, you know, LTV 1200, whatever the case may be, or some of your, uh, you know, other home care events that are single circuit, they have a mushroom valve, there's some sort of a, an issue with it sticking, um, not exhaling all of that CO2 and the patient's rebreathing it. That's really what they're saying. Causes of decreased 
and total CO2. You see some of them as they load here. So metabolism, you know, you know, where the patient is, you know, anxious or just the very, you know, heart rates higher, you know, if you will, producing a lot more CO2. Um, circulatory system, cardiac arrest, embolism, sudden uh, hypovolemia or hypotension, and the respiratory uh, you know, issues as well. Um, alveolar hyperventilation, equipment leak in the uh, airway system, partial airway obstruction, uh, and tidal, or rather, um, you know, uh, endotracheal tube in the hypopharynx, so it's not properly placed. Review questions, quickie, quickie, choppy, choppy, then we'll be done here. And again, these I'm going to go through really quickly. If there's time, we'll go over some other questions as well. Recommended treatments for uh, symptomatic bradycardia include which of the following? Okay, cut, ready, cutting to the chase in the interest of the time. Correct answer is the administration of atropine and pacing. That is like classic. So plain and simply, the general feedback, recommended treatments for symptomatic bradycardia include atropine, pacing. Just, you know, bake, if it's not already baked in your memory banks, bake it in there. Which of the following is not, not recommended for the therapy of supraventricular tachycardia? Correct answer is A, is A. Think about it. You know, you really want to speed up somebody's heart rate who's already in supraventricular tachycardia. The others make good sense. You know, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and adenosine were, um, again, classics. The uh, arrhythmia, which is characterized by chaotic baseline. No discernible P waves, irregular QRS, best describes which of the following, atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation. The arrhythmia, which is characterized by a PR interval, which is longer than 0 0.12 to 0, 0 0.20, but is generally not accompanied by other ECG abnormality, best describes, what we just went over a little bit earlier, first degree heart block, first degree heart block. Most appropriate treatment for ventricular fibrillation is which of the following, immediate CPR and rapid defibrillation. Okay, immediate rapid defibrillation. The longer this patient stays in this rhythm, meaning atrial fibrillation, the, 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 long, the, the, the worse their prognosis, they're gonna eventually end up asystolic. Um, so that's pretty much the, the standard of care there. Which of the following is not an indication for capnography? This is, you know, confirmed proper two placement recovered, adequacy of ventilation during mechanical ventilation, adequacy of ventilation during moderate sedation. So the, the outlier, the one that doesn't really fit is diagnosing smoke inhalation, which you'd need what cooximetry for. Likely cause a significant increase in antidal CO2 levels during spontaneous breathing trial or SBT most likely indic indicative of which of the following? A, a significant decrease in minute ventilation suggesting the patient is not, not tolerating the spontaneous breathing trial. And A, a rapid increase in capnography to normal or even above normal levels during CPR of an intubated patient, often indicative of which of the following? As the patient is experiencing a return, it's a good thing. Return to um, spontaneous cardiac activity or ROSC. Selected references are here. You know, again, uh, you know, Earhart or uh, uh, Goldberger, Ham, you know, Phelan, these are classics. I am not suggesting, by the way, I am not suggesting that you guys, you know, you know go and purchase these books. What I would say is this. When just like we had somebody ask about uh, chest x-rays. Likewise, if you want to review this, one of the sources that you can go to is ecglibrary.com or really put in ECG interpretation um, you know, tutorials, if you will, in the Google search box. You're going to get, you're going to get a ton of, uh, in many cases, pretty high quality um, you know, tutorials that'll help you guys out with this. With that, with that I want to thank you guys very much. Um, hopefully you uh, enjoyed this presentation and hopefully you found it uh, productive. Thank you.